Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly webinar of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. Um, today, we are broadcasting in partnership with COHA, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, DMV Bolivia Solidarity, and the International Committee for Peace, Justice, and Dignity. And we are pleased to have back with us today, um, Ali Vargas. He is a, an English and Bolivian journalist. He's been live on, reporting live on the ground from Bolivia since December, post uh, fall 2019 presidential elections in Bolivia and the subsequent OAS coup. So thank you, Ali, for joining us. Um, this this afternoon on what the F is going on in Latin America. Again, it's great to welcome you back. And I want uh, to share a, a video, some reporting that you have done from Bolivia. I'd like to share that clip with the audience now, and then um, and then let's start our conversation shortly uh, thereafter. Kazakhstan News is the English language service of Radio Kazakhstan Koga, the official outlet of the six federations of the Tropico, who are the Chapari Campesino unions leading the fight against the U.S. backed regime. <laughs> Eh, que pretende hablar desde las bases campesinas, desde las áreas rurales y que busque dar información real. Radio Kazashwan Koga has become the most important media outlet providing a voice to the indigenous and worker movements throughout Bolivia. The movements have been persecuted since the November 2019 coup. This service in English reports from the Tropic of Cochabamba and was created because the social movements demand that their struggles and the human rights abuses they face be heard on an international level. The regime must be aware that the world is watching them. To shine a light on the situation in Bolivia is to shine a light on how the U.S. maintains control of the global south. Bolivia's indigenous campesino movements are now fighting to save Bolivia's natural resources from colonial plunder while fighting to restore the popular indigenous democracy which has been built while demanding fair elections in order to do away with Washington's puppet regime. La radio va a ser eh, con esta línea permanente, línea anticapitalista, antiimperialista, extremadamente popular, altamente participativa además, que es lo que queremos. Pero al mismo tiempo, el hacer este tipo de, de, de medio, como es este papel en el medio de comunicación, es también muy peligroso, porque en tanto tú cuestionas a las autoridades, siempre vas a recibir eh, eh, amenazas, eh, siempre vas a tener a alguien mirándote de cerca o de lejos, o de repente apuntándote con, con el con el arma del, 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 de apagar tu medio o de intervenir. Eso pasó en estos días de conflicto. Cada día recibíamos llamadas de amenaza, diciendo que apaguemos la radio, diciéndonos que nos estaban mirando, nos estaban escuchando. As Bolivia's regime desperately tries to cling to power and cancel any elections, they're looking to shut down media outlets like ours. Just a few days ago, Interior Minister Arturo Murillo said that Castashwan should be shut down for promoting so-called sedition. Follow Castashwan News on Twitter and Facebook. So, Ollie, welcome back. We're so pleased to have you, have you with us. And today we would, um, we're going to ask Ali to give us an update um, on how the, how Bolivia is proceeding towards the election set for September, September 6th, am I correct? That's right, yeah, September 6th. And, uh, and then we'll also discuss um, the um, recent IMF loan that the Bolivian government has um, has agreed to, um, and so we'll talk eco politics and economics and in and include how COVID-19 is affecting the people and the economy as well. So Ollie, I'm so pleased um, to be talking with you again this morning. Welcome back. And um, why don't you give us a little update on um, 
well, there's a lot happening with the OAS right now, isn't there? <laughs> that especially the, the, the New York Times has even, has even uh, agreed that um, wasn't the best uh, and fair coverage of the elections from, from that body. So, so why don't we start with the OAS? Yeah, I think as, uh, as many of you may know, the New York Times released a report showing the flaws in the OAS report that said that there was fraud in Bolivia's election. Obviously, the New York Times aren't the first people to say this. The Washington Post um, wrote a similar report a few months ago. And then, but months before that, when this was actually happening, when it actually mattered, the Center for Economic and Poly Policy Research um, showed, you know, said what these outlets are saying now, showed that the OAS report had been manipulated, was deeply flawed. But of course, they, when they published uh, their findings in November, to November, December time, when it could have meant something. I think the international media outlets didn't want to give it much coverage. Obviously within Bolivia, it was deliberately ignored. But now that the, some sections of America's sort of mainstream media has caught up with it, there's now, I think internationally, people are much more aware about how the OES um, sort of manipulated the situation to create the ground for the coup and for the destabilization of the country. And I think within Bolivia, there's an interesting sort of discourse, I think, among mass supporters who are obviously the largest section of the society, um, the largest party in the country, the largest number of voters, they see this as sort of confirmation of what they thought before. But the sort of pro-coup sections, sort of right-wing sections of the country are trying to sort of portray this as a sort of Venezuelan Chavista plot. They say that um, the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, have sold themselves to Chavismo, have sold themselves to the Center of Economic and Policy Research, which is obviously absurd. The Washington Post and the New York Times uh, virulently sort of anti-Venezuela, uh, have virulently anti-Venezuela coverage uh, throughout you know, the past 20 years of the Bolivarian Revolution. There's certainly no Chavistas. They just stated some fairly simple and obvious truths about Bolivia. And for that, you know, they're being labeled as Maduro agents. And the sorts of, uh, you know, the sorts of discourses that all right-wing Latin American governments use to sort of um, put down any kind of social discontent, any kind of criticism of their own failings, of their own corruption, is to say, oh, well, you know, Maduro is responsible for all this. So uh, it's, it's becoming more and more ridiculous. But I think, you know, the CEPR's report, along with the Washington Post and the New York Times, although the, the other two outlets have come extremely late after, you know, sort of repeating the After the deed has been around done. The coup, <laughs> I think it will help, you know, uh, sort of mass supporters on the ground to sort of show, just to be able to cite, you know, these sources and say, look, there was no fraud. Everyone knows there was no fraud. Even your own supporters in the international media know there wasn't any fraud. And I think that, that will be useful, I think, uh, come election time. So, you know, I just want to, um, your comments about um, this is a, a Venezuelan plot and Maduro's responsible. You know, we're hearing a lot of that here in the States with the, uh, the Black Lives Matter um, uprisings, uh, particularly in Miami, as you can imagine, that you know, every everything's a Venezuelan plot. Everything is is Maduro, and that's the only line they seem to have um, here and abroad. It's really, it's quite, it, it, it's it's pretty ridiculous and overwhelming. But a lot of people, unfortunately, believe it. So let me um, ask you about what the conditions are like on the ground right now in Bolivia, leading up to election day what sort of um things are you seeing i mean hopefully as you mentioned the new york times giving some credibility to the um, sleeper report last fall that in fact the oas observations did in or their their lack of prudent observation did help lead to the um to the right-wing government we now see in bolivia what what are we seeing what are you seeing on the ground now among the different voter demographics leading up to September? 
Well, it's an incredibly difficult situation in certainly electorally in terms of the fact that uh, the government originally wanted to sort of ban, suspend all elections indefinitely. Elections were supposed to take place on May the 3rd. That got right. suspended because of coronavirus. I think all the parties, including the mass, have accepted that. But um, there was, we began to see in sort of the end of May, was a number of protests, uh, not organised by the mass, sort of spontaneous protests in working class areas of the big cities and in many rural areas, sort of demanding elections. They began as protests, um, sort of demanding food because during this whole lockdown, people have been left with almost nothing. But they grew into sort of political protests, demanding elections, sort of free and fair elections, um, and demanding that the authorities set a date. Uh, so. After a lot of sort of negotiation and a lot of compromise from the mass, September the 6th was agreed on uh, as a date between all of the main parties except one and, crucially, with the country's sort of official electoral council. So that should have been the end of the story. However, the regime and uh, sort of decided that, this, you know, this is too soon, September. Uh, they were using the excuse of coronavirus, saying that, you know, there's a risk of contagion. Um, that, that will be, you know, the worst month for coronavirus. Three months' time is going to be the worst, even though we've already been living with coronavirus for three months um, at the moment. But eventually she sort of gave in, um, had to listen to the growing protest movements that were happening all around the country, and she agreed to uh, sign the law for September the 6th. However, since then, since she signed the law, we've seen like uh, a number of uh, some most senior figures, her vice presidential candidate, her interior minister, who is uh, sort of runs the government essentially, um, and a number of right wing protest movements essentially come out and say that no, the, September the 6th is too soon, um, using the excuse of coronavirus to say that you know elections should be postponed indefinitely. How can we um, set a date for elections when? There's uh, this pandemic, etc., and uh, so um, I think everyone is very worried that the president uh, Anyes, the self-declared president, is going to say, "Okay, I accept elections, but maybe you know these sections, uh, sort of mobilising sections to our right to sort of pull her into a direction that would uh, end with the elections being banned once again." So I think people aren't um, aren't, feel, aren't feeling very sort of comfortable with this new date because we know that the right want to ban the elections. We know that uh, Agnes is third in the polls. She has no chance of winning even in the second round. So they, there's no way that they're going to want to go to the polls. There's no way they're going to want to go to the polls when by September the economy is going to be destroyed, when they haven't finished privatizing the country's natural resources yet. They haven't found buyers for the lithium. You know, they haven't finished destroying the, the sort of the organized social movements and union movements. So while all of the things that they were sort of installed to do, they haven't finished yet. So I think while they're not going to win democratically, they're not going to uh, go to elections, until, at least until this project of theirs is finished. Maybe then they'll um, accept elections and accept, you know, leaving power peacefully. Wow, so I have to say I'm really, I'm really pleased to hear you so overtly frame the Anya's government this way, that they were installed to do a certain project in Bolivia, and that project being the privatization, basically, of the entire economy, particularly natural resources. Can you um, touch just a little bit on the lithium, since that's been such the controversial resource since the elections? I mean, at first that contract under uh, the Morales government was with the Germans, then canceled, then with the Chinese, and now back with the Germans. And it, has it not been sold to anyone at this point? Or? Well, under, um, under Evo Morales' government, there was a deal uh, with a German company. But the deal with the German company was focused on the industrialization of lithium. So the idea of Morales' government was to not only extract lithium and sell it uh, off somewhere to be made in other factories, but to actually create 
lithium products, batteries, medicines, mm. uh, cars and stuff within the country. And of course, that's a um, very expensive project. And they brought in a German company to have sort of minority stake uh, to provide the investment. But Bolivia, the Bolivian government, nationalized company called YLB, um, would have a majority control over the whole process. So I think I've spoken to a number of uh, unions as well in, in that region where the lithium is, which is south of Potosi. And they say that, you know, there are certainly things that they maybe could have been improved, but the overall it was a good deal that provided um, provided public control over the natural okay. resources and would have provided the majority of the revenues, would have allowed it to come into um, to the public purse rather than to foreign companies. However, as soon as the coup happened, that, can, that contract was cancelled and the whole project of um, industrialising lithium has been completely paralysed. The factories are closed. Um, it hasn't been sold off yet, but the whole all work that was ongoing is, uh, you know, tools have been downed, to put it that way, like, just like a number of other sort of big economic development projects in the country. But we already know that the economy minister um, of the new regime has said that part of the sort of economic reactivation after lockdown would have to include inviting, he said, numerous uh, foreign companies mm. in to exploit the lithium. And Añez is a VP candidate, uh, one of the richest men in Bolivia. He actually tweeted over Twitter. He sort of tagged Elon Musk, asking him to come to Bolivia and set up a, a Tesla battery factory uh, for electric cars. So that's the, I mean, by the way, Elon Musk didn't even reply to him. That's the sort of, you know, uh, level of, of groveling which the Bolivian government is willing to do and which, you know, they're not even getting respect from, the, from their own allies on these issues. So that's the situation with the lithium. We know that there's, it's going to be, um, sold off at some point. Of course, it's an incredibly complex and expensive project, so it's not going to be an easy process, sort of starting it up and, you know, and, but we know that that's, uh, that was a key part of why the coup happened and it's a key uh, project that they need, still need to complete. And as I said earlier, they haven't done it yet. So, right. you know, are they going to go to elections if they haven't done it, if they're going to lose and they haven't done it? You know, I think this is really important for our viewers to understand that you had a, a prior government who still was involved in the, in the extraction industry, but using the, the, those natural resources to develop the nation from within, infrastructure for um, the nation's own people. Whereas now you're looking at... Um, a coup government who's using the natural resources in what we would call perhaps a neo-colonial manner where the natural resources are extracted and sent out of the country with no further benefit to the actual citizens of Bolivia, regardless of political affiliation. So, so this is the project that's not finished yet, is the complete privatization. And so you and I were talking before we went on the air about the recent IMF loan that has been taken by the, by the um, Anya's government. Let's talk a little bit about that and how that is one more step to indebtedness and privatization and this project that hasn't been completed yet. Yeah, so they've taken out a huge IMF plan, it's $327 million. Uh, they tried to do, they've been trying to do this for about a month and they haven't been able to because under Bolivia's constitution, those sorts of uh, moves have to be approved by the legislature. And of course, since that's an elected body, the mass has a majority because it's the largest mm -hmm. party in the country. They've rejected it because, you know, we all know how the IMF works. We all know how um, uh, the IMF indebts countries and then requires them to privatize industries, requires them to make huge sort of cuts, public spending cuts to key services, health, education, um, and a number of other things. And um, so there was a kind of deadlock for about a month. And then finally, the um, Añez issued uh, a supreme decree, which essentially bypasses the democratic procedure. And then just, you know, to allow the, 
the the loan to take place, and and now Bolivia is indebted to you know over to the tune of over 300 million to the IMF, and uh, what we're going to see is a number of cuts to, um, to key public services. You know, just at a time when the health services have already collapsed, we're going to see that situation become even worse. We know how the IMF has worked in Argentina, for example, during the last four years of the Macri government. Uh, the, where you know Argentina lent billions, sorry the IMF lent billions to Argentina, and it triggered an almost total collapse of the economy, hyperinflation. We can see in Ecuador now yeah. um, a number of uh, well, the government to meet its requirement, meet its obligations with the IMF, they've had to introduce a number of laws stripping workers' rights, uh, closing down a number of, sort of government services, nationalised industries. Uh, they've even closed some embassies. That's the level to which the, the state just uh, has has nothing left after indebting itself to the IMF. So I think Bolivia is going to be following the same path. Obviously, you know, a long time ago, I think we could have said that it was to do things like this that the coup took place. It was to, you know, put Bolivia in this position that the you know, that was a key reason for why the coup took place because for 14 years uh, the government had rejected the IMF, rejected the IMF and the World Bank, had had an economic strategy that was based around, um, was a developmentalist strategy through public investment, uh, building sort of nationalised industries that could provide revenue for the state that can then be invested in education, in health, in infrastructure. I believe you had no infrastructure. 15 years ago, it now has, you know, some of the best in the region. So, you know, that was the model that has, uh, that is being sort of destroyed at the moment. And I think it's, uh, you know, in four years in Argentina, they destroyed the economy. So I think in, in one year, they're going to do, but they're going to do more or less the same in Bolivia, which is why people are so keen to the elections take place as soon as possible before they can do even more damage, before, you know, the debts to the World Bank and the IMF get even worse. So what, um, you know, I would argue, and I think you would agree, that this project is taking place all over the world. I mean, we've seen this massive privatization of all public um, institutions and infrastructure and, um, and pretty much being replaced by corporations, transnational corporations and global capital specifically. We're seeing the results of privatization here in the States and how our inability to respond to COVID-19 because the healthcare system is almost completely privatized and so few people have financial access to it. So it's, it's everywhere and we're really watching it rapidly and quite um, horrifically unfold before our very eyes in Bolivia. So, Ali, what can we do here in the States and, and across the world as Bolivian solidarity um, people? What can we do between now and September to, to help raise the voices of the Bolivian people and to make sure the elections do take place on September 6th? Well, I think... Um... You provided some of the answer just now. You said it's important to raise the voices of Bolivian people. I think that's the most important uh, thing to do. And people here, uh, social movements, trade unions uh, that I speak to all the time are desperate for uh, their message to be heard outside the country as well as inside the country. Uh, the government is very sensitive as well to the coverage they get abroad. And they know that you know the more eyes there are on Bolivia, the less likely they are to be able to just um, uh, disappear people, lock, away, lock people away in a way that they'd want. So I think if, you know, it's important that the regime know that people haven't forgotten about Bolivia, because if they think that people have forgotten about Bolivia, then uh, they'll feel that they have a free hand. I think, um, so yeah, I think it's important to amplify that message, amplify, you know, the voices of the Bolivian social movements are something that, you know, we're trying to do here at uh, the radio. I'm speaking to you from Radio Casa Chukoka, which is a media outlet based here in Tropico, Cochabamba. We have an English page, Casa News, which is doing the same sort of in English. So I think, um, you know, 
spreading that message is hugely important. I think uh, as well as we get closer to the elections, it'd be, inter- it'd be important as well to have international observers in Bolivia. Mm-hmm. I know Code Pink, when there was the old election date of May the 3rd, Code Pink was planning to come uh, yes. to help out with that. And we were sort of going through the process of making that official and formal. Unfortunately, that's been suspended now. But I hope that, you know, Copink and other organizations can do that. I think there's some conversations that the UK, some representatives from the UK Labour Party might be coming. I think that would be uh, very important because we know that the, if elections do take place, they won't necessarily be free and fair. They probably won't be free and fair. So it'd be very important to have international observers there to catch, you know, catch them out committing fraud, real fraud this time. Um, but maybe even the presence of international observers that, you know, are friendly to the country's social movements, maybe just the, the very presence will uh, scare them off from committing uh, fraud in the way that they would want to. So I think all of that is, is very important. But I think something that everyone um, can do is just to, to not forget about Bolivia and to keep spreading the message and ensure that, you know, the attention is still, is still here because it will become incredibly important as we get to the elections. Well, it's a big, it's a big project. And yes, you're right. We were, we had a delegation put together to come and uh, observe the May 3rd elections, election day, but also a pre-election um, day delegation. And, and I would argue that's probably even more important because the, the before election day is when all the intangible activities happen, right? All the things that the activities that the government puts in place to prevent people from actually participating on actual election day. Fear, reduction of poll sites, all those games that governments play to discourage people from voting. So maybe we can do two, <laughs> I would propose. One, one before leading up and then, and, then uh, and definitely be there on election day. So we're still working on that. I would let you know that, that we are still working on uh, on that and I would let um, our viewers know that as well. And so in closing, Ollie, is there anything else that we should talk about before I let you go back to your, your important work there? I'm so happy to have a few minutes of your time this morning. So. <laughs> no, no, thank you for, for having me on. It helps to you know, spread the message about what's going on, to shine a light on what's going on. And yeah, as I said before, I think it's, incredibly important that people don't forget about what's going on here because Bolivia is not just um, about this country. I think Bolivia is an example of how, uh, of what happens in Latin America when the US intervenes, when the US installs a puppet regime. This is what happens, persecution, uh, privatization, economic crisis, uh, racism and discrimination on a mass scale uh, unseen for many years. This is how the US sort of uh, controls Latin America. This is how the US governs in Latin America. So I think by talking about Bolivia, you gain an insight into, you know, into, into the struggle against imperialism in Latin America and what it means to be uh, under sort of US rule, US intervention in this region. So I think um, all of that is incredibly important. And thanks for having me on again. Oh, thank you so much. And let's stay in touch and um, let's try and talk again between now and election day. Be great to, um, to keep um, hearing from you with regular updates. Really important. Yes, so, okay. Thank you so much for your time. Great to talk with you again. And um, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.